We gather again on a beautiful Sunday in this welcoming place, in this liberal religious community, we welcome all. Our generations join together to nurture spiritual growth and personal transformation, that we may be inspired to transform the world with love, hope, compassion, and justice. Live Oak is dedicated to celebrating and nurturing our diversity of thought, our generosity of heart, and the search for truth and meaning in our lives. As we gather for worship this morning, we are delighted to welcome Patrick Lyra Lanier. Patrick Lyra is a longtime friend of Live Oak, as well as the LGBTQ Outreach Advocate at Pacific Pride Foundation. Patrick Lyra has an MA in clinical psychology and somatic psychology, and has just passed their final marriage and family therapy exam after six years of program and found out yesterday. So we're very happy for him. Welcome, Patrick Wyden Lanier. Reverend Sharon Wiley, and I, I think we've heard them before in here. It is said that a church service should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. But we are all afflicted, and we are all comfortable. May our time together this morning be a comfort and a confrontation. May we here find peace in times of tumult. May we here invite tumult into our lives of peace. May we here find calm in times of restlessness. May we here allow restlessness to evolve into action. Let this be the place you consider what you've never considered. Let this be the place you imagine for yourself something new and unthinkable. May this hour bring dreams of new ways of being in our world. Come, let us worship together. For years, a certain phrase has floated around my periphery only recently landing on my shoulder, sinking its talons in, sending its resonance down into my bones. Don't make perfect the enemy of good. The phrase is deceptively simple and makes sense. Little victories, everyday attempts at betterment, clear efforts to learn, even in the face of doubt and fear, are critical and worthy. Mistakes are actually allowed. Unlike that one long shoot in the board game Shoots and Ladders, missteps need not entirely undo every previous step taken in the right direction. Repair is often needed when mistakes are made, and repair can happen. Uncomfortable, itchy-like, red-faced, sometimes clear-eyed and unflappable, repair can happen, and the march can move forward. But don't make perfect the enemy of good. Most of the battles I've fought since I was born are steeped in a painful kind of perfectionism. And to be clear, it wasn't my birth that caused this problem. It was the world I was born into. Assuming my internal gender identity perfectly matched the shape of my body, demanding that my gender be perfectly male or female only, asserting that I had to be 100% attracted to women, that I had to wear unquestionably masculine clothing always, and so on. If these boxes were not filled in fully, the punishment was that I would not be cared for by my peers and family. Perfectly perform, perfectly, like a monkey on a chain, they seem to say, and not always with their words, or otherwise lose the loving human contact needed by all primates to survive. This perfectionist ultimatum was received clearly by me at age eight, when I first froze with anxiety, panic, and depression about how to live in such a world. Talk about life in a pressure cooker. Don't make perfect the enemy of good. Taking it one step further, we could remix the phrase, don't make perfect the enemy of a happy existence. To exist, has never meant perfectly. Nature, in fact, abhors perfection. 
She seems to delight in all manner of beauty, offering up albino penguins, gyandromorphs with half male and half female plumage or coloring or wing design in the case of butterflies, and the most wildly complicated same-sex male ostrich courtship. And to be specific, these male ostriches run at each other first at 30 miles an hour, then pause to dance in courtship, one of them sweeping their wings low in the dust, head bowed in homage. Now try that the next time you're at the gay club looking for a partner. <laughs> Thirty miles an hour at each other. I think I've actually seen some gay men do that, actually. Um, <laughs> but nature also, I think, doesn't conceive of happiness as something isolated and separate from sadness or sorrow. Like all artists, she blends the two regularly, knowing that the truest truth is shaded, informed by gradations and not the boring human binary of either or. Don't make perfect the enemy of good. For survivors of abuse, perfectionism is a familiar ghost. Its hands clenched around the ribs, a threat built into the nervous system by the abuser with all the care of an engineer constructing a skyscraper. If the survivor does not walk the line, does not obey the echoing voice of past abuse, the ghost of perfectionism will cinch its hands like an iron corset and breath will be destroyed. There's little room for mistakes when you're so haunted. But still, we survivors create to-do lists impossible to com complete and then lambast ourselves for not being good enough. We set Olympian goals with only pedestrian training and knock our fists against our skulls when we perform less than a god. It takes time to see how perfectionism grips you, how it sets you up for failure, how the words sliding out of your mouth can become those of the ghost itself, a drawn out molasses slow yowl of anger at life's beautiful mess. And suddenly your voice is that of your abuser, whether directed at yourself, at a loved one, or at the universe too. You'll never be good enough. Don't bother trying. I'll only love you if you're perfect. But don't make perfect the enemy of good. In the world of social justice, centered on elucidating the intense, shadowed, and cobweb intricate abuse of targeted minorities, ghosts of perfectionism seem to thrive. And I refer to minorities as targeted here because social justice is not just about tallying populations to see who is numerically the most and least. It's more importantly about illuminating the tenor of treatment toward humans forced to live limited lives, while many pay full taxes, no less. As feminist psychologist Laura S. Brown clarifies, quote, I have come to eschew the use of the term minority group for a number of reasons. Rather, I refer to target groups and dominant groups. Target groups are those social groups that have historically or continue currently to be targets of discrimination, bias, oppression, and maltreatment. This clarification is important to me, as there's an active directional power imbalance relevant to most targeted minorities' experiences, and invisibly at play as well in the lives of dominant groups, giving them greater access, often greater material wealth, and ease of living. This directional power needs a name, targeted minorities, and is also relevant to how perfectionism warps and impacts social justice work. <clears throat> now, until two years ago, the majority of my social justice work unfolded in my preschool classroom at a local Jewish school. I pushed for my classroom to be inclusive of all home languages, to have radical small group discussions about gender as a fluid construct, to engage and welcome with all family systems that walked through our doors, including those with same-sex parents. After capping off my 10th year in the field of early childhood education, I was called to take over the new LGBTQ plus program at Pacific Pride Foundation. And so I entered the world of social justice with a capital S and a capital J. 
Don't make perfect the enemy of good. Now, I had always joked as a preschool teacher that I loved preschoolers because their inner dramas are so clear and close to the surface. Though they have tantrums, it's easy for me to have compassion because they're reckoning with the understandably terrifying onslaught of human existence <laughs> for the first time in their lives, usually. Um, they're in need of a helping hand to find the right words to say, to enrich their emotional awareness, and ideally to learn how to build egalitarian human relationships. Often, if they trust you, they'll directly ask for help. And it helps that preschoolers are generally chubby, cute, and cuddle literate. <laughs> but adults, I used to joke, send them to someone else. The egos, the jockeying for power, the gossip and the politics, a good percentage of it inner drama transferred onto the outer world. Please get me as far away from that adult baloney as I can possibly be. Well, guess what the social justice world is full of? <laughs> Hint, it's not preschoolers. <laughs> Answer, certainly not always, but too often, in my opinion, adults acting worse than preschoolers. And I say worse because adults have prefrontal cortexes, ideally. <laughs> preschoolers don't. So if an adult is acting like a preschooler and not using that part of the brain, worse, in my opinion. But it's not simply the case that such adults are out of control. What I've noticed is that most adults are drawn to social justice work out of a deep and compassionate care for the targeting of vulnerable minority populations, many of which might contain their own self siblings, partners, children, or loved ones. Such driven social justice workers are often able to map systems of oppression, to discuss them in a rich theoretical language as esoteric as hieroglyphics and sometimes as well rehearsed as a cult. Such folks long to and do assert messages of liberation in an effort to break up harmful patterns of oppression and to help free targeted minorities. And hello, pot, I'm the kettle. We're both black. I am a part of this stuff, too. But one thing I began to notice the longer I steeped in the local, state, and national social justice brew was that I seemed to have a bit more patience for teaching that not everyone in the social justice world appeared to display. And I guess that makes sense. I spent a decade teaching preliterate children how to write and how to begin reading. Doing so requires patience as deep as the Mariana Trench and as wide as the nighttime sky in Montana. You simply cannot teach a child to read quickly, so either you learn how to breathe or you stop teaching. It followed, at least to my brain, that similarly you cannot teach groups dominant or targeted to quickly undo learned oppression and then immediately download new languages of welcome. The process for doing so is necessarily rife with mistakes because neurons have been wired a certain way, often for decades, formed usually in fear-based conversations with primary attachment figures, be they parents, teachers, or coaches, saying things like, uh, gay people are bad, or transgender people aren't real, that's just a story people are making up right now. These neural pathways that are so strongly formed are literally undoing themselves through conscious lack of use and redirection to new, more welcoming thought patterns, but usually with immense emotional discomfort undergirding the entire process. Plainly put, it is not possible to wave a wand and force a group of people to instantly understand what they quote unquote should about any targeted minority population. And yet, this is the message I too often hear, that out of thin air, groups should not struggle with acceptance, especially dominant groups, that they should just listen to whatever social justice nonprofit of the thousand too many swarming Santa Barbara County has the stage. They should instantly change their language, their perspective, their identity as a member of a dominant or targeted group or a combination of both, all to welcome a targeted minority in need instantly, that moment, perfectly. They should shelve and repress their questions, many of which might sound offensive, but which often arise out of their inner child's yearning to understand. 
mi madre me dijo esto sobre gente gay, pero estás diciendo algo diferente. My mother told me this thing about gay people, but you're telling me something different. How do I reconcile this? How do I undo decades of fear patterning? Is it okay for me to be in process, working toward acceptance, instead of right there, perfect this instant? Don't make perfect the enemy of good. I'm not from Santa Barbara. I'm from Syracuse, New York, one of the biggest stops on the Underground Railroad, a city referred to in 1851 as a, quote, laboratory of abolition, libel, and treason for its liberal pushback on the enslavement of captive Africans. And yet, given that liberal history, what I found growing up in Syracuse in the 80s and 90s was that the racism us Northerners love to pin so much on the South had just gone underground in many of us as individuals and families. Many folks learned not to use a language of hate, following the rules of good social justice advocates everywhere about vocabulary usage, but rarely reckoning with why we were doing so. This meant attitudes of segregation, racial stereotyping, and more simply submerged and lived strongly under the surface all because of the perfectionist pressure to perfectly perform a welcome without wrestling with the pain, blood, and suffering of non-white citizens who need the welcome not as a courtesy, but as a deeply lived act of reparation. As one African-American woman said on the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday in a 2003 article in Syracuse I remember reading as a teen, Quote, Northerners will work alongside you, but they won't live near you. Southerners will live near you, but they won't work alongside you. You can't win either way. And it was true. Despite a Northern performance of perfect liberal welcome, the systemic segregation in housing and socioeconomic status raged on as badly as it ever had since Reconstruction. Don't make perfect the enemy of good. When social justice work is possessed by the ghost of perfectionism, it finger wags and shames the audience. It demands a rote performance of welcome that rarely engages with the actual mess of undoing oppressive systems that live primarily within the individual. This approach becomes very interesting when well-meaning allies, who often straddle being dominant in one category, perhaps being white, and targeted in another, like being female perhaps, when folks like that become so overly invested in the role of crusading, of rescuing, that they themselves become the mouthpiece of a new kind of abusive perfectionism. But indeed, most people doing social justice work are on some level a targeted minority. Most of us carry lineages of survival, whether of interpersonal abuse, sexual assault, or even the abuse of what my graduate professor, Dr. Ray Johnson, calls subcortical trauma of socialization. In plainer terms, that means the way we are simply socialized, to be male or female perhaps, can trigger trauma responses from our fight-flight brain, even if we are interpersonally not being abused or harmed by those in our close circles. So as survivors, and also as social justice workers, some of whom have been blessed with greater protection than others, we have to remain vigilant for the ghost of perfectionism. It hinders learning. It hinders our ability to join in conversation and to unpack what has warped our inner selves from our conception on. There is no targeted minority or dominant group member who is free of bias or of complicity in a system of oppression. And most of us inhabit both targeted and dominant groups. Some of us have greater access to dominant privileges. And those are the folks who must do the greatest work. And to these folks, I do clarify or want to clarify that, yes, you can make mistakes. But you can't keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Take, for example, using the wrong pronouns for a transgender person. When I'm not in the room, you can reply to the question, where's Patrick Lyra with, oh, they're in the restroom. I am a they, not a he. Those of you who know this, who've been told this, can work on getting it more consistently right than wrong. 
but you do get to make mistakes. And actually, some of you this morning just simply caught them and moved right on. It's a model, not of perfection. <laughs> but it was a really ideal model where I wasn't placed in any kind of role where I had to correct as a minority. It was just quick and easy and very validating for me. But you do get to make mistakes, get to apologize quickly and move on. And when you need to do extra research, it's on you to do it. Not to seek out a targeted minority to be your source of information, unless, of course, you're paying them to do this, and they agree to that arrangement. Because that seems fair to me. If you need consultation on LGBTQ stuff, just give me a call. <laughs> but you should also know, if you're in that dominant group, that other transgender people also get my pronouns wrong, regularly. So this work is not that of a dominant group. This is all of our work. We must all not make perfect the enemy of good. Um, as a transgender and queer person who happens to also be white and perceived as male, the issue I run up against is that I want more than good. I want the world to be instantly better, not just for me, but for all of my loved ones. I want perfect and instant welcome of my friends who are transgender women of color. I don't want them to be stopped on State Street and asked invasive questions about their genitals by strangers or prevented from using the correct bathroom by the police. I want all of that to stop right now, this instant, right now, all of it at once. Perfectly, just once. I don't want my family, who are women of color, to be followed by male catcallers of all races, to be harassed while shopping in a department store and denied opportunities at work because they are well-studied, assertive, and capable, but also of color. I want this all to stop right now. This moment, January 29th at 11.04 a.m., I want it to stop now. My heart doesn't want good. It wants perfect. But perfect is the finish line. And good is every step we take. If we insist on perfection as our method, as our way, then we will only ever feel like failures, and we will miss the opportunity to hew out little victories. So let perfectionism, or perfection, be something less solid, an aspiration, but not one we mistakenly believe is the truth of this moment. Good attempts, good learning, good conversations. These are how we keep moving forward, undoing the implicit bias and harm we have learned to inflict before we knew we had learned to inflict it. Good is how we build the future without burning out, without losing ourselves to the disembodied grip of per perfectionism's ghost. May we together breathe against that grasp and welcome in the good. May it be so. Standing and join hands for the benediction. The world is too beautiful to be praised by only one voice. May we have the courage to sing our part. The world is too broken to be healed by only one set of hands. May we have the courage to use our gifts. May we go in peace. And now, as we extinguish the light of our communal chalice, our service truly begins.